This moment has been celebrated with the sound of guns. But these guns have been fired in salutation and not in anger. The distant hills will come the glow of fires. But these fires are fires of celebration and not the bivouac of encamped armies around. From the voices of our children have come songs. But these are not songs that are marshaled in air, but songs of praise and gladness for this day, the day of our independence. On the 14th of February, 2004, as St. Lucia stood on the eve of his 26th anniversary of independence, I had a rare opportunity to speak to a man many refer to as the father of the nation. Our conversation would last several hours and run well into the night. As he detailed everything from his childhood to his radical entry into politics, about him guiding St. Lucia into independence and beyond in a never-before-seen interview. He speaks frankly, highlighting the highs and the lows of his political life. And let me tell you, the history of Sir John is the history of the development of St. Lucia. I didn't know I was not a St. Lucian until I entered politics. I always accepted myself as St. Lucian. I was born in Canada. Yes. Uh, but as a child, I spent a lot of time in St. Lucia, particularly in the Meek the Denry area as a child. I went to the Anakin School here, went back uh, to Canawan, went to school there, and by the time I was 11, I settled here permanently and uh, went to the first the Castries Intermediate School. Uh, there were three secondary schools at the time. There was St. Mary's College, Castries Intermediate School, and the convent. The Castries Intermediate School was uh, started by two enterprising men, uh, York uh, and La Cobigny. Uh, a lot of people seem to have forgotten about these two men, but they uh, were entrepreneurs in secondary education. I, I came here and started to go to school there, and I ended up in the college, St. Mary's College, and I stayed in St. Mary's College until I graduated. You know, in those days, uh, as a student in, in the college, you weren't too aware of, too, not too socially aware. We weren't involved, we didn't engage ourselves in any social, social disputes, any, any, social, any contentions. There weren't any politics in, in, in St. Lucia because it was during the colonial times. There were no, uh, no political parties. It was what the administrator said, what the governor said, and a few articles in the newspaper. But we, are, as students, did not concern ourselves too much with, with uh, political affairs. And even Curacao, uh, when I, we started to become aware, more aware of things in Curacao, uh, we had one goal to, as we left St. Lucia, our goal was to earn our profession, get a profession, and get back home. Went to look for a job, but the only place you could look for a job in secondary school was in the government. And I think there were 10 of us who graduated that year. And we all went to look for a job in the civil service. And uh, I was offered a job in the post office at 10 pounds a month, that's $48 a month. Uh, and I worked there for a week, and I heard they were taking people for Curacao. Uh, so we decided, all of us, that form, all of us decided to, we not, this, this is a dead end. This civil service at 10 pounds a month is a dead end. We can't see, and we can't uh, accomplish our goals. So we all went and Recruited, got recruited uh, for to go to Curacao. I worked into Curacao uh, for 
two and a half years. I went to Curacao really to see if I could earn enough money to to get a profession. The profession I was thinking of really was neither law nor politics nor anything, but I'm far from that. The profession I was thinking of at the time was engineering. I wanted to be an engineer. I would have got an engineering uh, scholarship at the time that started what they call higher education scholarships. You had to go and be trained and come back to serve St. Lucia. They weren't bonding. They don't sign you up to bond. It was, a, it was like a, a, a thing of honor that you would come back. You agreed to come back. And the only two of them came back. In all, I think they were sent over 20 or 30. Two came back, Charles Cadet and Graham Louise. All the others stayed abroad. Greener pastures, they didn't come back. Well, I applied for, for the engineering uh, scholarship, and I was turned down because I did not work for the government. I went to, to Curacao, and I started to study for law in Curacao corresponding courses. So I got, with every fortnight when I get paid, I save a little bit and get the courses, etc. So that uh, when I left Curacao, I came back, came back here and it was really touch and go whether I should would go to, to study at all. When I went got to, to, to England, I got there too late for the entrance into London University as I had applied to go there. So I took the summer and I did my inter-LLB, my first year, externally. And I went off to Wales to do economics. I did economics in Wales. Uh, and the University at Wales, it was a very small university. Very good, very intimate, etc. but too nationalistic. It was too close, it was Welsh. The only foreign students you, you, you met was a, a couple of people, probably one from Malaya that I knew, another one from, from uh, I think, the Gambia, and so the, the British had sent in scholarship, but there was no foreign, there no, I was the only West Indian, and they were bought, uh, at least for, for what they call colonial students, they probably bought 10 of us. So I found that Wales was too confining, although they, they, they the courses were very good, the lectures were, were very good. I did, uh, did very well there. I decided it was too narrow and confining. So I left and went over to the School of Economics. Uh, and I stayed there until I graduated. I completed my course in law. How did I get into politics? Let's get into this. At the time in, in London, the London School of Economics was a ferment. You know, it was really in, in, it's stirring up. The big stirring in, in England itself. The Labour Party just come in, got their, their first term. They were, I'm speaking about the, the British Labour Party, and they, uh, they were conducting a lot of changes, and, and it was rather exciting. Then there was the colonial struggle in Africa. You meet people like Nkrumah, and you meet people like Zik, and you, you meet people like... Uh, like uh, uh, Nero, all of these people. It was a ferment at the time. It was great colonial struggle, very exciting. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, West Indians, you, you met the, the great names that come through, you know, and you meet them in the, in the little cellars and in the, in the coffee shops and the smoke rooms and planning to how to change the world. And then, of course, there was the West Indian Student Union, which was very powerful, very bringing all the West Indians together. And therefore, we, we really, uh, in, in those days, it was quite exciting. You, if, it was, if you didn't realize what your goal was, you would be sucked into the politics. But of course, my goal was to complete my degree as quickly as possible and to come home. When I came back home, St. Lucia had changed. They, they had uh, universal adult suffrage. There was elections. Uh, there was the, the, the parties here, there was the Labour Party and there was People's Progressive Party. Uh, and of course they, that was just politics in name because there was, they had 
the responsibility but not power. The power still was with the administrator and the government. The poor people, poor fellows who were elected uh, in, in, into parliament, the people looked to them to do something which were the co they were complete, completely powerless to do. They had no power. They can just the, the legislative council was just a talk shop. Uh, so when I came back, came back home, they, uh, as I said, things had changed. There was the a lot of people whom I know, the middle class, they had been destroyed by the fire, and there was the fire was a great equalizer. People who were living in the big houses, etc., found themselves living in the CDC. People who who had uh, who had the big homes or living in barracks. And so the fire was a great, great social equalizer. So th that is this notion I returned to. I came back and started to practice law. And of course, you must have a base. My base is now the Eastern District of Miku and Denry, where my, as I told you from the beginning, where my grandparents had, and even my great, my great grandparents had started. They, and they established themselves there, they were known there, so I started to practice law there. Uh, then in 54, that there were elections again, there was elections in 51, and now elections every three years in 54. The person who was representing the, the uh, constituency was James Charles, the father of George Charles. So let me come back, getting into politics. Uh, the, as I got interested in, in that constituency, uh, the people came to me. They were dissatisfied with James Charles. I was, I was then, when I came back home, I joined the Labour Party. Uh, and after a couple of years, I was actually secretary of the Labour Party. But in '54, when uh, they had elections, uh, the people came to me. People came to me and asked me to represent them. I, a whole contingent of them, and they were pestering me. So I said, "Okay, I will come." And I told the uh, told the Labour Party that I was interested in the Denry seat. And of course, I could not get it because George, uh, James Charles, who was George Charles's father, was held the seat. So I decided I was going to run independent. Uh, so I ran, ran independent with uh, with James Charles, who was the incumbent, Lennox Williams, a farmer who was quite popular. Uh, F.G. Charles, they used to call him Guati, Guatemala Charles. He was a farmer and a bus driver. And myself, we were four. And that is the only election I ever fought. I never had any problems with that constituency between uh, 54 and when I left in 96. And that is the only, when the, the the great avalanche came in 97. It was the only one that stood up the East. These elections I won. And uh, I, now, I was independent. I was then sucked in an attempt. I was the radical, you know, I was called all type of names, communists, all this type of thing. I was the radical, but I had to be tamed. Now, how do you tame me? By, as it were, buying me. And I was brought into what they call the Executive Council. Executive, there was a Legislative Council of eight elected members, and there was the Executive Council that was controlled. The majority was uh, with the non-elected people, the administrator, the financial secretary, the, uh, the attorney general, the, and two persons nominated by the administrator, and there were two uh, chosen from the, from the legislative council. 
So I was one of them, and Le Corbinier, Dr. Carl Le Corbinier was the other, so we two. So that is an attempt to tame me. Uh, so I went in and, and served for a while, then there were changes. I was then an independent. There were changes in 1956. We had the semi-ministerial system in which uh, persons from the House of, uh, House of Assemblies, it said now it was then Legislative Council, were elected to the Executive Council and became ministers. Well, at that time I went out. I was no longer in the, in the Executive. Uh, in 1957, I rejoined, or 56, I rejoined the Labour Party. And there was a lot of upheaval. As I said, I, from the Eastern District, and part of that was sugarcane. The dominant crop was sugar. And the Denry Valley was one of them. And what I saw in the Denry Valley, from the time I came back from studying, I decided it was not acceptable in the 20th century. It was not acceptable in a civilized society. They had not emerged from, if they would emerged from slavery, they had not emerged from, from indentureship. They were still there under the absolute control of their state owners. You had the, uh, if you put, had your house, and most of the land was owned by the, the, uh, their state owners, if you had your house on that land, you had to work for the, for the company. And if you did not work from the, for the company, you had to remove your house. You couldn't keep a cow anywhere. You couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. And worse, what is worse, the social conditions. I'm not speaking about bad housing, of course, the jupa, the kai pai, all of these things, the barefoot people, the no, no civil amenity. Children, by the time they, the 10 years, they made their first communion, and that was all. In January, February, you had to go under the cane. The father is cutting the cane, the mother is bundling and the children are carrying. So you worked in gang, family gangs. Children up to 10, from 10 years upward working in the cane fields. The advantage you used to take of people, so I decided this can't work. So in 1957, there was a cane strike. And I decided that this got to end. So I entered the strike. And I kept it. It was the strike, Rosa, Cosdesac, and Denry. Rosa and Cosdesac nearly, nearly caved in. But I kept Denry going until that thing was broken. And in, when people look back at the modern history of St. Lucia, they would look at that strike as the defining moment, social and economic moment in St. Lucia. Because the the master saw that his day was finished. I kept it for six weeks. They brought in police from, because the St. Lucia police were not going to go and shoot St. Lucians. They passively supported us. They brought in from Barbados and Grenada, whatever it is. I was arrested, I taken, put on a on a uh, Canadian warship and kept there for about eight or ten hours and then released and then kept on the curfew. I could not go to the valleys for a couple of days or whatever it is. But I kept it there because I know that the, the social conditions under which these people live had to change. But the... So, uh, as I said, from that time, the shackles off because the the uh, Kozisak and Rozo they gave in and they formed the public companies they sold out shares to the public etc 
but the only estate that is owned by individuals then. The Keynes, the cane factory went on to, it, it ground that crop in 57. By 58, they started to convert into bananas because cane was finished. To them, there was no future in cane. They started to convert into bananas. And then I got the cane farmers at the time to also to convert into bananas. So I gave them an alternative crop. So it wasn't that I had so many hundreds of cane farmers on my hands, nothing for them to do because I destroyed the cane, the cane crop. They, I got them into bananas. I had got a farm, a small farm in Miku, which I still have in the Miku area, growing bananas. And as in to encourage people to get into bananas, I went myself. So just to show as an example that I am I'm in it and therefore they can go. In fifty seven there were elections in which the Labour Party won uh, seven of the eight seats. We, we won the whole of the East. Uh, we, we lost Sufre. Sufre was the only seat that the Labour Party uh, did not win. McVean, Lee McVean, he held on to Sufre. So the Labour Party at the time became dominant in politics. They, at that time, the new people had been entering into the political field. Besides me, there was uh, Morris Mason, who died quite young. Uh, he would also returned from England, and other people had started coming in and giving some really uh, organizational strength to the Labour Party. The, before, it was just shouting a few things in the slogans in the market steps. There was no organization. There was nothing at all. We gave it the organizational strength to myself and Morris Mason and those others who had come in. Uh, so that in 1957 elections, the Labour Party came and became the dominant power. Between myself and Morris Mason and others, and others within the Caribbean, we started to, to push for also for more greater constitution reform, for greater power to be vested in the local representatives. Between 1956 and 1960, the administrator was still the head of the executive, there was no chief minister. In 1960, there was a, the, we had, we pushed for constitutional changes and the British agreed to give constitutional changes and you had uh, a chief minister. Some, a person, the, the chief minister then was head of the government. George Charles became the head of the, of the government. In 1961, they had elections again. So you had elections in 54 that I participated in. Uh, in 57, uh, in which I participated, and now elections in 61. The, in the 61 elections, uh, we had the new persons. They, they extended the constituency, the number of constituencies from eight to 10. The Eastern District, as it was called, the Denry and Miko split into two. Uh, I took the Miku side and I brought in Morris Mason into Denry and we both won. Again, as I said, other people were coming into the Labour Party. Uh, Dr. Vincent Monroe had come in and he won the Sufra seat. So the, 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 the complex, the, the complexion of the Labour Party started to change from the trade union base to pe more professional people, myself and Morris Mason and Clive Compton and and uh, Dr. Monroe and so on. Start giving it a, a greater professional uh, character. 
Now the people who were involved from the, the trade union days, they started to become very suspicious of us. And they gave us a very hard time. They, uh, they called us, you know, we want to take over. At, at that time, the, the, the term intellectual was a, t was a term of insult. You know, the intellectuals coming and, you know. And they, between uh, George Charles and Odio Jean-Baptiste and Colimo uh, and those people, they gave us a hell of a time. So we found it intolerable and we left. Uh, I left with, Mon with Monroe's and uh, Dr. Monroe's and, uh, and Morris Mason. And that more or less fragmented the Labour Party and broke the power of the Labour Party that they did not regain until 1997. People's Progressive Party was an urban party. Castries, Sufra, Fairfort. The Labour Party was more rural and more worker base, while the people was more middle class and urban. So when we are, uh, when we we left uh, the Labour Party, myself and Morris Mason and Monroe's, we formed our own party for the National Labour Movement. Of course, the Labour Party that joined the, uh, what I would call the reactionary forces, and they branded us communists. We were branded as communists and we were this and we were that. And, uh, we stayed with the National Labour Movement for about, didn't last very long, about two years. There was no room in St. Lucia for third parties. The Labour Party had its, its uh, uh, worker base, the Maliwe as they called them. Uh, the PPP had the urban middle class and we were just there. So we decided really, yeah, this is, this is no, no future in this sort of thing. So we decided to form the join together with the, the PPP. They had one member in the parliament. We had three members in the parliament. And we formed the, the uh, United Workers Party with uh, the People's Progressive Party with George Mallet in the parliament, Henry Girodi, uh, Wil Wilfred Sinclair Daniel and persons like that, Michael de Bully, uh Antoine Theodore, and so. Uh, we formed the we formed the United Workers Party. The Labour Party's goose was cooked. Let's look at, at the change, the shift in political in in in, in in, in the political uh, alliances. I had had the Eastern Districts, the Banana Belt, solid. The PPP with Mallet and Girodi and Dibole had the urban areas. That was eight. So where where the Bousquet is going. Evans Bousquet had seen virtually the, the death knell of the Labour Party with this sort of, of sh shift in political power. So when we started to put pressure on the SLP because of the interfering with the bananas, Evan Buske saw his opportunity by backing the banana farmers. Now, so they don't go bananas. You see? So it's really an opportunistic move on his part. And, well, he, uh, when we started to put pressure and George Charles tried to bring the bill, we moved the vote of no confidence in the... Uh, in his government.
with the full knowledge that either the Bousquets would vote with us or would abstain and the government would collapse. So what George does dissolves the House before the vote of confidence could take place. He's dissolved the House. And we went into elections. We, of the United Workers' Party, we won six seats out of 10. And the Bousquets came and joined us and gave us eight out of 10. So, uh, the, as I said, it was the alliance of the urban middle class and the banana farmers that made the shift in politics in St. Lucia and that remained from 1964 until 1996. Listening to Sir John as he detailed his youth and his entry into politics, I mean this just fascinated me. I was fascinated by his determination and his vision. It showed he cared very deeply and thought strategically about making the lives of St. Lucians better. His United Workers' Party had taken control. Now he was chief minister. And I was very excited to hear what came next from the man who was now in the driver's seat. When we came into in, in 64, it was a period of change in the economic, social and economic change. Uh, you had the sugar industry was out because by, as I tell you, the start, then we started to change from sugar into bananas by 58. By 61, they had gone completely out. In 64, Geest had come in, not 64, earlier than that, I think about 62. Geest wanting to expand his market in, in England, wanted more bananas to fight for a bigger share in the market. And they, therefore, they decided they, they must have the production base and they decided to offer to buy out Roseau and cul-de-sac that were then in sugar. Geese agreed they would keep Roseau in sugar, but they would convert cul-de-sac cul into bananas. But by 1964, Geese found that sugar was a losing game. So they went and converted into bananas. So in 64, we have St. Lucia now pushing ahead in bananas. So we look and see really how do we strengthen in these changes from sugar into bananas, how do we bring in St. Lucians into the banana economy? Because just having a piece of land and a cutlass does not make you a farmer. You must have some financial base. So there was a fund, monies in, a, in a, what they call a sugar fund. The monies in the sugar fund uh, that was there for the sugar workers, etc., etc. Now, with the sugar out, we took that sugar fund and we made it in available to the farmers to convert from sugar into bananas. So that is when we started the first agricultural credit. And so the farmers can go and now borrow money. Even you didn't have proper title, as long as they know you're a farmer, you could borrow money to, to cultivate bananas. They, as they, in, in the song, I think is one, one of the songs about bananas said, with, with, with my strong right arm and my piece of land, I will live and die a banana man. 
So we tried to strengthen that banana farm, make him from a, a lab away, a laborer into a farm. We had to create a middle class, a farming middle class, and we used that money from the agriculture credit to create that farming middle class. I am quite emotive about the banana industry because I see the changes, this industry, the social revolution, quiet social revolution, this industry has made in this country. The people, you could go to the bank and borrow money because I'm planting bananas and every week I have a crop to sell. Every week I have an income. If St. Lucia is to go forward, the people must be educated. What did we have? Two schools at the time. This, the Castries Intermediate School had got long gone. They went with the fire. Fire destroyed the school, never rebuilt. People migrated. Uh, you had two, the convent and the college. All of them fee paying. If you could afford, you and you have the the elementary qualification, you go to the college or the convent. The total number of students attending those schools was less than three hundred. Now, how could three hundred students, even all of them, uh? entered in, in, into the, 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 the work stream, workforce. Even all of them entered. And a number of them didn't enter because girls got married and stayed home. How could you develop a country with only, uh, how many, about 30 or 40 graduates a year? How could you develop? So we decided to push into education. When the Americans were giving up the bases in Fairfort and Grosley, I negotiated for the handover, and one of the things I negotiated was for money for a secondary school. And I put down the Viefort Secondary School. That was the, the third secondary school, the first new one in a hundred years. So to educate the people from the south, because in those people from, from the Viefort and Suzelle and Sufa area, took, took, when they want to go to schools like migrating, going to another country. They had to get some cousin or some auntie living in Castries so they can live there during the, uh, the, the school term and then go back. People used to take their children, when, when the children leaving, uh, let's say Miku or so, pack them in the bus and cry <laughs> because they're migrating to another country. That is the, you know, people must understand what we had 30 years ago. St. Lucia is a new country. This St. Lucia. I had a man like Hunter Francois, who was my first minister of education. And Hunter pushed on the, uh, the moon uh, we, for, for teacher's training. We had a little shack in Saint Souci. That was all we had. We used to send three or four students a year to Erdison College in Barbados and a couple more to Trinidad. That was a total oh, number of trained teachers, something that was about 5% of the total, total uh, teacher population, about that. So that is what we had. These were the tools with which we had to work. Every bird has a nest, every, every crab has a hole, every human being must have a house. As the economy started to grow, we started having the internal migration. As in every country, the city is the glitter. The city is the magnet. People coming down to look for work. We have a new middle class. 
at that time. Let's look at what the St. Lucia society was at the time. A girl would stay at home, at her parents' home, until some gentleman, and I say gentleman, would take her away. You know? Now the, the economy is getting modern. The girls who were working decide they're not waiting for any gentleman. They want their own homes. So we must provide for them. What did we have? We're on castries. Look at castries. You had castries. The, the, uh, the area where they used to call the Hollywood is not there anymore. Hollywood and the, there was Brooklyn and Hollywood, some little model cottages there. That side, you go up to the chaussee and you go down to Castries River and then you meet the sea. That is the totality of Castries. Then you have the slums of the Conway and the slums of, the, uh, of Marshall and the slums of Washoe. That is the totality of Castries. So you had to get land. And in getting land now, you again closed in by history. You know, history is now box you in. You still have, you still find the land, even in the, all the land in the vicinity of Castries, owned by the old families. Sans Souci was owned by the Barnard family. Miss Clavier owned. Entrepôt and that area. So we they had the Moon owned by the War Department in England. Or the Moon area, Moon and Kubari, owned by the War Department. So what do you do? So we decided look, we have to acquire. We are going to buy the lands once it becomes once it comes under urban pressure, we have to acquire. So we negotiated with the Barnard family and we bought the Conway and Sanssouci. We negotiated with the Clavier family and bought Entrepot. We negotiated with the War Department, British War Department and bought the lands, bought, bought the moon. We created organizations. We created the Urban Development Corporation, the UDC. And the UDC first, it was, it was first the Mourn Development. Then it was the Mourn and Sans Souci Development. And as we expanded, became the Urban Development Corporation. The first chairman of the Mourn Development was Alan Busquet. When Alan became a minister, I then expanded it and I brought in Reginald Mitchell to handle the UDC. And we had persons like Leonard Oje, engineer. He was both engineer, he was architect, he was meta tout fait. And we then, first development was at the Sans Souci. We sold those houses and lots for $17,000 complete. I hear the noise in the market steps now. Don't buy. The place is swamp. It's going to sink, etc., etc., etc. Okay? But people who bought at the time, now they had a sweepstake. Then we went to the moon, the moon development. Because of the access road to the moon, it was difficult. People didn't have cars. They had to get home. So it, the moon went very slowly until we start improving the road to the moon and then more and more people start living there. So we had the Urban Development Corporation. We, when we were doing the radio, we speak about the radio otherwise. Also, we used the Urban Development Corporation to buy land at Radway. Radio Orchard, Radio Park, UDC, 
UDC. The people in the eastern area, they wanted lands. What was a, up at Entrepot? A cocoa estate. So we acquired and built, put the Entrepot development and more and more people going. So we, we, we had, you had to create the blocks, the building blocks, the organizations. So in agriculture, we had the bank. It's not only agriculture. Agriculture is it, it, expanded into fishing, to small businesses, etc. Until, of course, it's dismantled now. You know, but that these things were what they call a piece of social engineering to change, use your your organization to change society. So we gave now the middle class, the teachers, the nurses, the civil servants. The persons in the banks give them an opportunity for the first time to own a piece of St. Lucia through the Urban Development Corporation. We, cre we also now created the, uh, the St. Lucia Mortgage Finance Company so they can go and borrow money from there. We strengthened the cooperative bank, you know, in order to, because Hopefully Bank was at one, one time was the only bank that would lend long to, do long-term long lending. To help. Yes. And um, particularly the, the the water supply yeah. as it relates to health, because we had the Bihazio yeah. situation. Well. And if you want to. Yes, well, uh, if we can talk about health, let me take, take you back to the beginning. When I started to practice, as I told you, my major practice was in the Eastern District, Denry. I had to go to Denry every Thursday because that was the day for court. Sometimes I used to stay, I was not married then, but that doesn't, is, that is not for the reason why I stayed in Miku. I had my farm up there. Every time I pass on the road, you see probably two or three, five persons trekking the road to Denry, from the Mabuya Valley to Denry, with plastic flowers and a little box, no bigger than a shoe box, a coffin for a child. So, Let's start again. Yeah, as I told you, I used to come from Miku or Denry. Denry going up, Denry to court. Miku probably coming down. And invariably, you see this little group. The man will have a little box of white drum in his pocket, and he's carrying on his shoulder a little box the size of a shoebox. The mother running beside him with a little, some plastic flowers. A child going to be buried. <laughs> Why? Waterborne diseases, dysentery, diarrhea, rampant in the Denry Valley. Perhaps elsewhere, but I'm telling you what I used to see. This was my own experience. So I decided, hell, I got to do something about that. And what was worse, in 1966, Morris Mason, who I mentioned earlier, my best friend, representing the Denry Valley, go to Denny Riviere, drink water, and dies from typhoid fever. So what do you do? You have to do something about it. So I decided really, they had the, what they call PHEU here, and the PHEU, I, they said they're going to drill wells and, you know, putting a little plaster over a big bobo. I decided that we have to do something. So when you came in, 
the only places that you used to have portable water was in the middle of castries, we call central castries. And there was a pipe going to Marsha, where everybody used to go, because at one time some people used to have horses there, and the horses had to drink water. So you, the only castries, and Vierfort sometimes, and Sufre, Sufre had all, always had ample supply of water. Now, uh, you had, uh, that's, these are the only places to water. And the, the question of the infant mortality rate in St. Lucia from waterborne diseases was one of the highest in the hemisphere. Probably only less than Haiti. We had typhoid, dysentery, diarrhea, pilhazia, you name it, waterborne diseases. So uh, we decided to do something about it. And again, if you follow me, you look, you see, we are doing it outside of the civil establishment. Because they are too slow to react. So we created first the, the Central Water Authority so that water, we could have water throughout. It is now called Wasco or Wasa, whatever they call it now. Well, it, even in my time it became Wasa because we added sewage, but it was CWA, the Central Water Authority, so that we have the, the, the question of provision of water in the... Uh, in, in the Stuart St. Lucia was centralized under one authority, the CWA, and we started to expand water throughout. Now, if you did not expand the water, you couldn't have the development. First, the water is health. You had to expand water. So we expanded water first in every major town, then in every major community, and look if we didn't do that with the banana industry and the fertilizers and the pesticides and the nematicides and the pollution of the rivers. You know what we'd have had? What the disaster we'd have had in our hands? So all of this take careful planning and foresight. We expanded the water. They had, Bilhazia was a major, major killer. We couldn't do it ourselves. And all of these things I'm telling you that we did in St. Lucia, it was, it was done in St. Lucia. But we had a lot of help from other agencies and organizations. people. Again, let me give Hunter France for the credit. Hunter went to uh, a health conference somewhere and he met with some people with the Rockefeller Foundation and he introduced them here and Rockefeller helped us to put water in the first the areas that were heavily infected like the Mabuya Valley and the cul-de-sac valley put water in those areas so that we can get the people out of the river because generally it was the washing in the river, people getting, uh, getting attacked by the snails, getting in, into the intestines and that's the end. So we had the Rockefeller to assist us. Now as we, it was tan pipe in those days, everybody not everybody, people, the poor people went to the standpipe for their water. Now, and they used to have what they call the freeness, people going to public baths, etc. That is fine. I mean, that is how we grow. We grew up uh, gradually. So we expanded water. Now, when the United Nations declared 1980 as the decade of the water, in 1980. St. Lucia was one of the few developing countries that met the criteria because we 
as I said, we expanded water throughout the countryside, eliminated Bilhazia, typhoid fever, you don't hear about it again. Dysentery, and St. Lucia now has the infant mortality rate, people, children who die before the, the three years. St. Lucia is one of the lowest in the world, 17 per thousand, as the same as the United States or any other developed country. So there we are. Let's look at um, provisions that were made for persons so when they get old uh, to, to get you know, a pension. And when we could talk about the, the National Program Fund in the 70s. Yes, well, 70s. let's go back a bit <laughs> eh, about provisions for the old people. I mean, uh, not many of us in this room would know what used to happen before. They used to call, have what they call poor houses. My wife's grandfather had one in the Chaussee that he used to support. You had other, others around, the Catholic Church used to support some of this for the really down and out. The Social Security was by the presbytery used to see the people lining up there, either by Pappy Clark or by so-and-so, to collect the little sixpence and whatever it is every week. That was it. Now, there was no safety net. With the government, of course, apart from the civil servants, the, the permanent civil servants, no one has had a pension. In the major countries, they had the social security system. In the United States, they brought it out in the 30s uh, by Roosevelt after the, the great crash. In, in England, England didn't have a, a proper social security system until the 1950s. When we came in, we decided, really, once the, the economy is moving and we we expanding the employment, one more people, uh, in in proper jobs, in regular regular paid jobs, etc. Now, when they retire, we have to put something aside for them. So we created first the National Provident Fund. Now, when we created, when we started with the National Provident Fund, it was hell. We brought in the bill. There was demonstration in the streets and all of this. We did not get resistance from the people who were working. We got resistance from people who wanted to exploit the whole situation for political gains. But we pushed on with it. Now we have the National Provident Fund now the national insurance is expanding into health and then unemployment, etc., etc. It is the most powerful institution in this country. The national insurance scheme started with $250,000, a grant from the government to set it up. That's all. Now the national insurance scheme from this worth over a billion dollars. I remember when we came in, we had, a, we had two major international hotels in St. Lucia. Major international. San Antoine and the villa. Now, in, in, in San Antoine had about uh, Mrs. French, you remember her? She was, she was more active in Red Cross than in, in a little, about six rooms. Then the big, next big hotel was the villa. Uh, and the villa was classic. The, there's one guest who stayed there told me, this is the only hotel where you have salmon for breakfast, salmon for lunch, and salmon for dinner, because 
the, the manager of the hotel was Miss Salmon, <laughs> and she was like the she she was the like the custodian of of a school for wayward girls, you know. I remember going there uh, with a friend. Uh, he had come in from uh, in one of the boats, and I had to take him to dinner. So I went there, and I didn't have a jacket and tie. And she told me she couldn't serve me dinner there because I was not properly acquired, uh, attired. But if I sit just over there, she can give me something to eat. <laughs> so that was... Uh, then we, in the, I think it's 1960, uh, when the Americans handed over, the raid we was on, there was a part of an American base, handed it over. Uh, and it's, perhaps the, be the beach was, uh, as, as, is as beautiful now as it was then, but that time it was a beautiful beach. I mean, we used to, uh, Castries was, you know, the city, and Grosley was country. So when you had to go in a big, big picnic and <laughs> and <laughs> big uh, excursion or whatever it is, you went up to Rayleigh Beach. Well, we, we the the land there was handed back to us. What do, could we do with it? We got the British government to the the Commonwealth Development Corporation to build the St. Lucia Beach. They built. They were, they were then trying to help us to, to develop, get into tourism, not on us. They, they built the Grenada Beach, the St. Lucia Beach, and one in Antigua, and one in Belize. It was a, a chain of hotels built by the, the CDC. Uh, now, we had had an agreement. We leased it to... Uh, a Jamaican entrepreneur. He was a big, big name in the hotel in Jamaica, uh, Issa. And as one of the conditions that he had the lease of that property was that he should expand to, I think, on the whole beach, 600 rooms. Try as we could we could not get any takers because when people came into the St. Lucia beach, you know, a lot of them had to leave by ambulance from mosquito bites. You know, it was, you had to be fogging the area, you know. The fog had to go around and round in the evening to fog the place with mosquitoes. The people in Grosile, now, the big industry, in Grosely for children after school. You came from school, you change your, your from your school clothes and you go in the pasture to pick up pick up cow down to you pick up cow down to burn in your yard to chase the mosquitoes and the sandflies. And now you as you sit here, if in those days you look grosily you see a whole haze of smoke. It is the burning of the cow down to keep away the mosquitoes. So we could not get this place. We could not get a tourist development in this area. Difficult. We tried, tried as, as we may, we could not get rid of the sand flies. So we called in uh, the company from Jamaica, the Matanos, who had experience in this thing. And they said, well, you can't fill the swamp because it was it would take, you cut down the pitons and dump it there, you can't fill it. I mean, so, 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 so deep. So what you have to do is to fill it. Fill it with water, with sea water. So dig, dig out the lagoon. But when you went down and taking off the muck, below that was sand and coral. So you had to dig it out. Where do you put it? Do you throw it away? Because it was hundreds of thousands of tons of sand in the bottom over this, I think the, 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 
the swamp itself, the, the, the muck, was probably four or five feet. But below that, because it was apparently the old, uh, and, and the, the old geology, that was, it was part of the seabed. So we found coral and sand. What do you do? Where do you put it? So we look at it. Let's join the uh, Pigeon Island to the mainland. Because some old lady told us in the old days when she was come from church, she used to actually walk and low tide walk from Grocery to Pigeon Island and during the low tide. So we decided for two reasons. One, we had to put the, the coral and the sand somewhere. And two, we had to create land to pay for the dredging. So we decided to create, I think, about 70 acres of land that joined Pigeon Island to the mainland. And once that was done, the sand flies disappeared. And the, but it remained there. This area remained as it was from 1974, nearly 10 years, until the marina came. And when the marina came, the place blew. So now, having got rid, rid, rid of, of sand flies, you have tourist development here. But you have another problem. You have a problem of transportation, air transportation. When we s tried to get into the um, tourist development, we got the Canadians to help us to expand the, what is now Curanora, then Beanfield to expand the airport to accommodate the jets. Okay, the Canadians came, they helped us. We built that airport to accommodate the jets. But Huanora is the one end of the island. Castries, the administrative capital, is at the other end of the island. And your tourism, area is even further up. So what do you do? How do you get it? So we improve the East Coast Road, improve the connection before to go to Via Fort. I mean, like if you, it was two days, one day to go. Yes, you leave in the morning, one day to go, and one day to come back, come back in the morning, come back next, next day. So two days you had to. So how do you get the junction? So we connected the East Coast Road. We built the East Coast Road. I would, you know, I must sometimes look, I have to look back a bit. I remember when we were doing the East Coast Road. The same problem I had in building the Castries Grosley Road, the resistance. Some little old lady's house was there and uh, don't move. Just like in the Conway, don't move. When we were doing it, I realized that uh, you, to push a highway through these villages, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to kill people. So I told the consultant, look, we have to bypass every one of these major settlements. So we back put the Denry Bypass to bypass Denry. Imagine the containers going through Denry Village. We bypass Miko. We bypass Viafort. We bypass Lagre. Every one of these villages were bypassed with the highway. I remember <laughs> you know, if you look back, you must <laughs> laugh at the nonsense. I remember hearing myself say that I don't want these, the tourists to pass through these villages because they're so poor. You know, I, want, I don't want the tourists to see the, these Denry and, and Miku and so because I'm ashamed, you know. But you did it. You have your airport. You have your, your roads. You have to get your electricity. 
Again, what did we have? What did we have electricity? When you speak about tourism, is, tourism is integrated. Uh, where do you get your electricity? Before we had electricity, a little pum pum there by the market, uh, a little tin can, only castries. Uh, there was no electricity up this way, up in the up in the north. I think gradually it got to the moon. Uh, so we had to expand electricity. We couldn't do it by ourselves. So we formed again a company, St. Lucia Electricity Services, with the CDC providing most of the money because we didn't have it. Castro City Council put in their share and government put in their share. So the Castro Town City Council now is, a, is, I don't know how it is now, but used to be when it started the major shareholders because we valued the land. What we had, or, or the government's uh, part, was the little power station we had in Sufre and the little one, we had, old one we had in Viafort. So we valued that. Castro City Council had more because they had the land and they had the bigger infrastructure, etc. So they put in theirs, and CDC put in theirs. So Castro City Council was a major player in this one when we formed the St. Lucia Electricity Services. And from that base, we expanded the electricity throughout the island. It was our goal, and now it has been achieved. Before, you used to have the 10 o'clock shift. I don't know if think any of you remember. When they used to blow at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, they used to blow a whistle uh, on the power station in Castries. Used to blow a horn. And at that time, your sewage parade started. And it was taken down and thrown in an old barge and taken to sea. That was our sewage system. Now, as you expand and put a proper sewage system, uh, your water consumption increases. When you used to, uh, the average household used to use what? Probably two buckets of water, 10 gallons a day. You go into the sewage, one flush is four gallons. So your water, as you build houses and you expand, the demand for your water supply grows. So we, in the, ha having done, we de did the rural areas, etc. Let's take the castries in the north. It was not enough. If you want to speak about your, your, your tourist development, and you want to speak about your tourism development, then you have to have your basics. You bring the people here by your airport. You transport them. Uh, by your roads, you bring them in your hotels, you give them electricity, they must have a bath. So all of this thing is completely integrated. So we ran, we see that, I saw that we were going to run out of water. In 19, I think, 76, I realized that in spite of all my efforts, we we're going to run out of water. So I went first to the Venezuelans for a study, then to the Canadians, then to the World Bank. And the Canadians took the lead. They gave us 50 million EC dollars as a grant, and they helped us to get the rest of the money from the World Bank to put down the Roseau Dam. The Roseau Dam is can provide water for the whole of the Castries Basin for the next 50 years in growth. You know, we are, uh, I started off with coming back from England and opposition to colonialism and the countries must be independent. When we talk about independence in those days, we didn't speak about St. Lucia as an independent country. We spoke about St. Lucia within the Caribbean Federation. That was the big talk, Federation. Federation failed. 
Then we tried with the uh, Associated States, as they call them, hoping to get them closer together. We couldn't get that. We tried the Windward Islands. And while we were negotiating the Windward Islands, that's its coming, uh, coming in, into 1974. While we were negotiating for the Windward Islands to come together, and the first we start was, say, with freedom of movement, freedom to work from work permits, freedom to own land, etc., etc. While we're talking about that, Grenada went behind our backs and negotiated with the government, with the British government, for independence. And they gave them the independence, despite all the violence and all of this in Grenada. Uh, they gave them the independence. So, what else? The next thing we hear, who is talking about independence? Dominica. Dominica is going independent. So what are we to do? Wait. So we, in 1974, we, we had elections in 74, which we won. Our program there, our political program was that together, if we can, alone if we must. So by 1974, it was alone because it must. So we started to, we informed, we went to the House of Assembly. First I went to the, we went to the party. We had a, a convention, party convention in Miku in 75 or 76. We had a party convention. We decided we are going into independence. We got a resolution passed in the party. We went to the parliament and presented the resolution in the parliament. Of course, it was opposed then. Uh, and we then approached the British government to start negotiation for independence. The, we had this problem. We had a British government representative who had been in Botswana, that's in Southern Africa, near to South Africa. And he was as racist and apartheid as, as they come. To him, black people shouldn't govern themselves. They, they can't govern themselves. Look what's happening in South Africa, look what happened in Nigeria, look what happened in Ghana, all this confusion. Now, so he became the ally, or the Labour Party used him as their ally. And every time they made a meeting and keep noise and make a demonstration, he would send it up to the, to the British and say, you know, is it going to be bloodshed in St. Lucia? Is it going to be this in St. Lucia? And he delayed us to no end. We went, we went first. They said, fine, you go back and show that the people really want it. Issue a white paper and dis discuss it all over the country. We did that. We went back, tell us another story. Until 1978, we went to the Constitutional Conference. Uh, we went to the Constitutional Conference in London and we agreed that we should we'd have our independence. We even set the date to the 13th of December. That was the date for independence. But the Labour Party at the time, they wanted elections before independence. And that has never happened. Jamaica got it without elections. Trinidad got it. Guyana got it. Grenada got it. Nobody ever that was never imposed as a condition on any one of them. But it was sought to impose it as a condition to us. And the Labour Party objected, they demonstrated, they did all of these things. Now, what had happened in, uh, in, in the Caribbean? There was a lot of turmoil. There was Grenada, there was Cuba, there was all of this thing. And they exploited that. 
they, they created a lot of confusion. There was coming to independence, uh, besides the, the demonstrations and whatever it is, coming to independence, they are they fermented strikes in the public services. Teachers strike, civil service strike, this strike, that strike, and trying to to postpone it, try to impede it. Well, of course, the, the, the thing had passed to the British Parliament. There's nothing they could do to stop it. What they did was to, to impede the celebrations of it, the way we would have liked to have celebrated our independence. We didn't want to celebrate our independence on the threat of riots, the threat of that. The, the, for instance, the flag-raising ceremony was to be the only place we had at the time was the Marshall Grounds, the Mindafilla Park, only place with the open, big open space and such. We had to keep it on the, on, on the wharf. Why did we keep it in the wharf? Because of security reasons. The British will not allow Princess Alexandra, who was the royal representative, to drive through the Marshall Road, lest she be ambushed, etc., etc. It's that type of fear. Not us, because we know that was nonsense. We would never do this. That's not Saint Lucia. But that British government representative had instilled, had pushed in the minds of the British. There were going to be riots, etc., etc. So we had it low-keyed. Many people didn't, didn't have it as we'd like to have had it. Instead of had the, the big celebration for independence was ready, the carnival that followed it because it was a few days after Carnival, was a few days after Independence, we had a hell of a time. But for Joe's times, it's really frightening because of the, the threats that existed at the time, that there were going to be disruption, there was going to be this, going to be that. The, the customs and strike, we couldn't get people in. We had to get, had to send send some people down there to take over from, from the, the customs, let their people get their baggage through. A lot of difficulties, it humiliated us. St. Lucians, it humiliated us. But I told them at the time with all of this, they, they came to give us very bad press. I used the occasion of the youth rally in 79 to set out our goals. I told them, told the children at the time, that we have to prove that not that we'll do no worse than those who ruled us before. Not that we will do as good as they did, but we have to do better. And that is what I set out to do, to do better, to give solutions and opportunity that they did not have under the past regimes. Let's look at um, what happened maybe just briefly after after in the, after elections. After which? 79. 79. 79 where um, you lost yeah. the elections. And I'm just wondering whether it's all this agitation all of this that caused... We didn't lose the elections. Should I never accepted we lose. The elections were hijacked. There was a hijacking. You know, all the threats. If you look and see the number of people who voted, it was one of the lowest. I think it was just over 55 or 60 percent voted. Thousands of people abstained because they were afraid. They were afraid. We lost the elections. We still, as the UWP, we still got 42% of the votes. We still had a substantial support. Now, you had this infighting within the Labour Party, which caused us a lot of grief. You had the, 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 the confusion between uh, Louise and the Louisi faction 
and the Ordnum fashion. It is similar to what I had with George Charles. And in, in, the, in the 60s, you had a new set of people coming in and con in getting in conflict with the older regime. And you had this leadership struggle. But what gave, what gave this thing greater, greater impetus is what has happened was happening outside. You had the, in Cuba, you had Castro. Okay? You had, in Jamaica, you had Manly. In Guyana, you had Burnham. And in Grenada, you had Bishop. So all of these factors concentrated on, on the confusion in seclusion. You know, when we came into in, independence, it was in the height of the Cold War. You know, there was the, there was Nicaragua, remember. There was Angola. The link between Nicaragua, Angola, and Cuba, then in a little slighter way, Jamaica with Michael Manley, Guyana. All of these impacted on us. Then you had the, the new leftists in St. Lucia that were fed from that stream. And they saw an opportunity. I'm speaking, we got pulled into the Cold War. They saw an opportunity of capturing St. Lucia, but using this new leftist element. Now, the person who stood in their way was Louise. Louise refused to give in. And he had to be pushed aside. So you had this confusion in St. Lucia, with this leadership struggle between the, the new left and the old left, new labor and old labor, etc. And St. Lucia population got caught up in it. But they weren't really involved. It was a little struggle by a small clique of people. No, it collapsed. The whole thing collapsed and we had to go back into elections in 82, which we won. And we won handsomely. Okay. Now, what did we meet in 82? The economy in ruins because we had not only what has happened, leadership struggle, we had, remember we had Hurricane Allen where the banana industry destroyed. So we had to start to rebuild. We had to start to rebuild in 82. And as a person was there, it took me three years before we got up at the bottom, before we started to move. People didn't know the trouble we had, but we had help. Again, because of the Cold War, the Americans were very happy to see those guys go. So they came and gave us assistance, gave us financial assistance to start rebuilding. The Canadians helped us, the British helped us, because they didn't want us to go the way of Grenada. Remember, within 21 days of, of St. Lucia's elections, we were on the 22nd of February, on the 13th of March, there was the Grenada Revolution. So we got caught up in that. We got caught up in, in this. That is how Sinusha became. That is why, you know, after the, the elections, then there was the, uh, the Grenada Revolution and all this confusion. In then, as soon as we returned, by 83, the intervention in Grenada. Again, we got sucked in to external politics, and we had to fight our way and confine ourselves rather than being drawn by it. So, but use it. Use the situation. We supported the intervention of Grenada, in Grenada. 
And so when that is out of the way, we, the Americans helped us to build the roads. The roads were, were in a mess. The British helped us to re rebuild the, the banana industry. The Canadians helped us, etc., etc. So we, ca we came into, into independence really. Not only our problem of independence started from 78, when the, the negotiations with and the confusion, local confusion, the, uh, I'm speaking about the assistance with the British government representative, the Latoc, Eric Latoc, I must mention his name. You remember when they went and the, the other one came in, they went to Malabar and smashed it up, and the confusion, the planning to take over by force, because the, if we had, I always say that looking back, is a good thing we'd lost those elections because they had their plan well made to take over by force. After the struggle for independence and the turmoil that followed in the late 70s and early 80s, the government of Sir John Compton regained control and remained there until 1997. Under the Sir John-led administration, the country saw major development in areas such as agriculture, education, health, housing, infrastructure, tourism, water development, with ambitious plans in the pipeline. But something was brewing, and a big change was coming. Now, in 92 elections, after the 92 elections, we had the question of changes in Europe in the banana industry, in the banana regime. Uh, because in all of these things, bananas impact. In the banana regime, there were changes. And uh, therefore, we had, to, uh, we had to adjust. I went to, after traveling quite a lot in France and in Germany and this, all, all over the place, to get a good deal. Having got a good deal for bananas and come, come back here, what do I find? Banana Salvation <laughs> Committee mashing it up. You know, I had a deal to, to, for us to export 127,000 tons of bananas. This year we only, last year we only exported 35,000 because we mash up the infrastructure. We mash up the association, we mash up this, mash up. I came back from, from Europe to find the, the place on the siege. So every time we lost elections, except this 2001, except this last election, every time we lost elections, it was because of fear Set of violence. In, eight, in 79, it was this violence. In 97, it was this violence. Oh, the road network. Um, even in the, in the agricultural area. The, the inner roads there to yes, help the yeah, banana. Yes, well, the banana you tie that there. in with the, with the, yes. Yeah, that's oh. significant. Okay. Also, the highway, the, the tunnel. Yeah, There's a lot of opposition. That's more recent than that. Yeah. They, well, let's speak about the, uh, the, the internal roads. You know, what, when we came into office, there was the main road, in whatever condition it was. And there were a few roads, some of these things they call extraction tracks. I realized that you could not expand your production and on the backs, the, I mean the physical backs of your people by carrying up a load of fertilizer. A bag of fertilizer in those days used to weigh it used to weigh uh, 200 pounds. They had to cut it in two, but they had to trudge it up the hill. You had children 
during the banana days because they have to have their parents. They, during the banana days, the children were not going to school because they had to go and head out bananas. All of these things, it was an impediment to your progress. So we decided whatever money we had, whatever, where we could get it, we could beg for it or borrow it or whatever it is, we had to put a road system. First to connect every major settlement. Because there are a lot of, we had big places that didn't have any, any road connection. They, they dropped them by the high road and they had to take their loads into their homes, etc. You find that you cannot modernize a country without proper communication. So we push the road network in every, first with every major settlement, then the farm roads and to open the valleys. That is why the banana production increased from what well, it was about 20 or 30,000 tons to 133,000 tons because we open up the country. Open up the, so in no point giving peace people a piece of land and they can't work it properly. Or they have to take their wives to head out bananas or take the children out of school. So the important thing we did is to open up the, uh, open up the countryside by pushing free the roads. And every time we got money, that is where we put it. Then you spoke about the tunnel. Yeah. Then I said, we, we spoke earlier about getting the important thing of getting the, uh, the connecting the, the, uh, the airport to your city, then to the your tourist area, then ex open up the, uh, your agricultural lands, etc. Now, you, Castries is your major port. People, the, the form of land transportation was changing. You had the big container trucks and the huge trucks. How do you get it from Castries to Veerfort or to Soufre? How do you get it over the moon? How do you get these container trucks over the moon? First, we tried to bypass and do it over the talk. You know, from Soufre to over the talk. We tried to bypass. The, this area and go up the moon, the other side of the moon. But the container trucks, either they couldn't go up there or they end up in people's homes, they ki they've killed people, so we had to get something. We had to connect the pastries to the south. And the whole, the whole tunnel road was for, for three reasons. One is to get your heavy uh, vehicles over the moon two was to push castries to the south as we did the castries goes to the highway to push castries to the north the intention was to push castries south move all your your heavy uh, industries things like cement and lumber and whatever it is your banana association, your coconut growers association, all of these push them in the valley. Your warehousing, have castries, port castries, to deal only with lighter cargo, uh, uncontainerized cargo, and the tourism, the tourist ships. So you have castries as really a commercial port an open cul-de-sac, port cul-de-sac, which had already been dredged to 60 feet in depth, dredged to take the big ships. You put another port, Castries, to deal with the heavier things, like your lumber and your cement and your fertilizers and your containerized cargo and push. So rather than... So what happened? What? What happened? What happened? It's 97 happened. Yes. Um, yeah. Office in ninety six. Yes. Why? Why? I'd given enough. Uh, from fifty four. 
54, I was elected to 97. I don't think that is enough. That is not three years as I promised myself when I first went in. I said I was going one term. No, 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 I thought that uh, the things were, it was time for other people to take over. You have, uh, I mean, the, the, the powerful, powerful uh, slogan in opposition, it's time for a change, you know? It's powerful, what do you, I've been there all this time, it's time for a change, anyway. No, I, uh, I left because I thought, really, it was time for a change. And let me just say that uh, people said that I, I did not uh, take a successor from within the party, I, as I should have done. Uh, I did not do so because I look at the type of problems we had to face. I believe that we had, I wouldn't say solved, but we were on top of our major internal problems. You had your, except for fine tuning here, in education and health and in your infrastructure, your water, it was all there. The, the platform for the, uh, for St. Louis had already been built. But we had to face challenges outside of St. Lucia. The WTO, the, the globalization, the, all of this thing, all of the, the in external negotiations, all, that's where our problems are going to come from. So we had to get somebody who can deal with those sort of problems. I mean, I can, your, your ministers, I think they were rather good ministers. But I don't, we needed somebody to lead the charge in dealing with the external environment, which I knew was going to be difficult. So I took somebody to deal with the external in environment. I never chose Von Lewis to be leader of the opposition. I never chose him to go to the hills at Olion or to the dawn at Bouton or so-and-so to try to persuade the, the people to, you know, I chose him to lead the country negotiation of the, this, this country must undertake in dealing with the external environment. That is why I, and I know he's qualified for that. If I had to choose him to go, choose somebody to go to Orléans or to Bouton, I would not choose one. So you must understand the environment, my thinking. You understand? I never, never expected the party to lose. I did not. It was a shock to me when we lost. Because my preparation, my preparation was not for that. If there was anything like that, I would never have taken George Mallet and made him governor general because George Mallet is too good a politician. I would not have castrated him by putting him there and taking him out of, of the system. He would have been there to support whoever is, he was either would be the leader because he's that type of fighter, or he'd be there to support that person who's the leader. But as I said, my plans were not for the St. Lucia for the, the, the party to be in opposition with Von Lewis. Lancy Coe, Mallet, when you look at the local scene, but as I said, the local scene, the problems to me in the local scene was controllable, but outside. The problems we face outside now. We needed a person like that. He knew in the external relations. He, he had interfaced with the, all of these major organizations, the World Bank, the this, the, the EDF. He had interfaced with them. He knew, the, he knew some of the people by name. So that was what, why he was chosen. You know, every man has a season. We'll talk about the alliance. 
Yes. Kind of briefly, and then we'll end by um, by you talking about over your, your period of time in, in politics, your major highs and lows, and and also for people to talk about your family, mm. now your involvement in politics, because it's when you give a lot of, of your time mm. to St. Lucia and mm. a little bit of St. Lucia, mm. and whether that had any, any effect. Mm. Or mm. Um, you know your family life. Mm. Mm. I don't know yeah. what to talk about. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about the, the alliance. Well, the uh, as I said, the where we, where we we stopped is about the the choice of my successor. Uh, well, the result of that was disastrous. I mean, we lost and we lost very badly, including the successor I had chosen. And the UWP remained in a, in in mourning. Couldn't doesn't seem to be able to get out of. Mourning. They chose. They went and uh, they had change of leadership. I I was recalled, and I found that they I couldn't work with those people who I had to work with. I mean, just a waste in my time. They always had what I propose. They always think it was not good enough or not, not, it wouldn't work, but they wouldn't give me something that they believe would work. It was all a negative, too much of negative, negative. So I decided to waste my time. So I stayed a few months and went out. Then uh, Lewis came in. And for some reason, he too left. Then we had Morella Joseph. So we had there no nothing settling in the in the in in the party. And the talk about the alliance. The I thought it was a great idea. I still think it was a great idea. But you have people with personalities. When you deal when you're having an alliance, you have to deal with people. And it couldn't work. As I, if we want to personalize the thing, I would work with George, but I would not work under George. I made it very clear. I would work with him. My relationship with him was something that people don't understand. My personal relationship with him never diminished. I mean, he. I knew that he had certain ambitions and I was in his way, and he did certain things that I felt offended by. But it never, never really affected the relationship that I had with him from boyhood. But when it came for us to work, we worked together, but I wouldn't work under him. So, because look, I mean, it's not power I'm craving. I've been prime minister for all these years. Now I'm going to come to work in a subordinate role. I would not do it. So because of that, the alliance broke up. That was it. It was not no more than that. If we had worked out something, uh, uh, a real alliance between us, the alliance between us did not come. We could not see how it could work. So, and we were the major players in the alliance. And once we parted, it went. Let's look at you. You're worse than a hard talk. <laughs> 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 Let's look at your major highs and lows. Um, you know, over those so many years, things that stand out has been you know, high for you, and things that stand out you know, I uh, I go to in politics. I entered politics with two simple philosophies. When I entered, I was in the opposition to the established order. I entered in opposition to the established order. I decided to do what I can to break it. I am satisfied that 
I have made changes okay but in that way I had one philosophy to help the cause that needs assistance and to fight the wrong that needs resistance having fought the wrong that needs resistance I was given the opportunity to help the cause that needs assistance having broken the back of the the established order the plantocracy etc it gave me an opportunity to help the cause that needs assistance to educate the children to bring water electricity whatever it is I did it is because I fought the cause the wrong that needed resistance so I could help the cause that needs assistance then having done that I look around and say how should I conduct myself I had one philosophy that I must look not for tomorrow's vote but look after tomorrow's children if I had looked after tomorrow's vote I would have been out of office a long time and with scandals but tomorrow's vote do important to me because I must have it to do whatever little good I can do tomorrow's vote was not the overwhelming factor and I was given an opportunity not to look only for tomorrow's vote the opportunity was given we come back to where I started the people of Miku and Denry gave me the opportunity to go out because my foundation was secure I didn't have to look after that vote not this this was secure it's secured even today in any one of those four constituencies I can go without holding a meeting and win anyone of those four Denry North Denry South Miku North Miku any one of those four because what I did I did not have to look after them for votes because they know where I stood with them but I my motto was to look after tomorrow's children that is why when I left the they gave me a plaque with every secondary school that I established in this country and when I go to drive down the street and I see the uniforms in every community I see the uniforms of secondary schools I am proud of that you know what about your laws? my laws? any if any no they must be when we lost the elections I was I was not the the, the, the 79 elections I was devastated 79. 79. 97 I was most philosophic about it I didn't expect it and, and I didn't expect the type the uh, the I didn't expect that type of results I was disappointed but 79 devastated me I just had independence I worked hard for independence Another thing that uh, was really, uh, I wouldn't say, a well, uh, low point doesn't mean I'm depressed, I mean disappointed, is when I, uh, I had just come back from the World Bank meeting, having, having just brought back a package for the banana industry, which 
I is, it was an extraordinary looking now it was a, a, an extraordinary achievement to have got us to a quota of 127,000 tons of bananas for export and coming down from my estate to meet the mobs in the street and for them the same place where I had, I had in Denry Valley, same place, to see them shouting for my blood, you know. I felt like, you know, like Christ, I don't mean it in a blasphemous way. I know how Christ would have felt when it was, as he entered Jerusalem, it was Hosanna. And then when they take him, the same mob, without changing their breath, Crucify him. So, you come back and you look back at these things. You have to, in, in public life, you have to be philosophical and you have to look back at history and to see it has all happened before. It's all happened to somebody before and it has happened to somebody after you. So it's just part of the price that you pay to be in public life. So, it is, what do you do? I mean, I, the shout, crucify him now, I pass the same crowd, Daddy John, give me a lift. <laughs> same crowd. <laughs> what do you do? Huh? Go home and cry now. No, no, no. Do what, you know, do what you have to do. Do what you've been brought up to do, to serve. And you, you have no regrets at all? No regrets. I have no regrets. No regrets. I, uh, some, I was asked a question, and without you asking me, if I had to do it again, if I would do it. Yes, but if I did it, if I did it, I would be, I would listen more to myself. Because I have been betrayed. I've been betrayed. I'm not. When I speak about betrayed, people is not. Uh, well, betrayed for. Let me see. Not for. I think for personal things, but uh, not by. I'm not speaking about my colleagues in politics, etc. People have really got my confidence and. Uh, and used it to obstruct me in doing what I think I ought to be doing. A number of people in the, uh, in, in this society have really obstructed what I'm going to do. I, I better be, be, be more specific than that. Uh, a number of senior people in the civil servants, service whom I should, I depended on and whom I knew, I knew of their loyalties. But you vote as you like. But I don't expect you. I don't expect anybody. And when I say anybody, I don't expect a person who is in a certain position to really pretend to be what you are not, just in order to obstruct and betray. You know, and a number of things I should have done or could have done, I did not do because I didn't listen to myself. I didn't listen to myself. I just, I decided and I back away. It was a, a big Castries redevelopment plan, which was to do, expand Castries, make Castries, we speak about tourism, Maycastry is a major entrepot like St. Martin because we have the harbor. For, with all the tourist ships, the tourists come here, they leave nothing. They go to St. Martin and spend their money. My whole idea was to use Castries for tourists, shopping, and for the light, smaller ships, etc. Your major things, put everything in cul sac I was obstructed there. Because in one of the little cliques, and you always, it always comes back to you, 
they thought I was in some big deal with some big company, you know, receiving money. So I said, you're not putting my character in line. I said, to hell with you. I'm not going to do it. I leave it alone. But if I'd listened to myself, Castries would be in a comp Even if I was out of power, Castries, from, from the customs, right up, coming over down through Saint Souci, tying up with, uh, with Point Seraphim. All of that would have been the shops, duty free, that area, the Bridge Street. That area would have been a duty free area. Flat 3% or 5% duty on leasing and with tourism. So you tie that in. You tie your shopping and your to redevelop and, and push all your cargo, your lumber, etc., down in, into the coast. But they put my character on mine and I backed away. I had the financing arranged. But I backed away. Because it, the, where the people who my character in line, the same people whom I've been asking for advice. When I say I for, ask for, for administrative it, you know. So these are the little disappointments I had that I didn't. But then anyway, life goes on. Would you come back? Me? Let me tell you. Camera's off. And he did come back. The man who brought us to independence became prime minister again. As he continued to write our history as he wrote his own. This has been Sir John in his own words. Thank you for watching.